Most pedig felkérném dr. Charles Vörösmarty professzor urat, aki egyet, egyenesen New Yorkból repült ide közénk, aki a New Yorki Egyetem kutatóközpontjának igazgatója, hogy előadást Good morning, uh, and I think you know from the nature of my last name that I'm Hungarian, uh, at least uh, genetically. And I apologize that my Hungarian is not uh, so, uh, so well established that I could present this in Hungarian. Perhaps someday if I spend a little time here, I'll be able to do so. Um, I, I do come from New York, and I uh, do represent, uh, I suppose, for this particular gathering, the uh, sustainable development community that has um, been working in the United States. Uh, I would like to report uh, to you on a major project that I lead uh, that's funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. Uh, it has to um, be mentioned that this is a collaborative effort, although I lead it, it involves eight different institutions and about 20 principal investigators, uh, our students and our postdoctoral scholars. Uh, the region of the country I'm going to be speaking about uh, is the Midwestern um, United States and the Northeast. Um, and there's some iconic images here to remind you that the message that I'd like to convey to you today is that there are important infrastructures uh, that we need to keep in mind as we develop these kinds of plans that uh, I've heard so much about over the last few days. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, the conference organizers for allowing me to, to speak with you in particular. Uh, my colleague, uh, Ferenc Vizsovic, and I ask has always been a supporter of, of these kinds of, of ideas. And I'll be talking about the United States, but I'm going to cross over the Atlantic and, and finish my talk with some uh, musings about what could be done uh, in, uh, in Hungary. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Do I press this? Ah, I'm in charge. Excellent. Okay. Um, so the, the uh, title of the, the uh, discussion here is uh, CFUs, and that stands for Climate-Induced Extremes on Food, Water, and Energy Nexus, and the role of engineered and natural infrastructure. Okay? And the whole idea here is to begin to articulate the role of nature and the role of engineering in providing services to this region that are of <coughs> quantitative significance. Okay? And uh, I'm going to be blending in this new concept of the third infrastructure. So we have what you might term nature-based infrastructure, green infrastructure, traditional engineering infrastructure, gray infrastructure, and then the third type of infrastructure is human infrastructure. Okay? And these have to all be co-balanced if we wish to design sustainable systems in the future. Uh, just to give you an idea why we focused on, on these two regions of the United States, uh, one important aspect of it is that uh, two of the members of the study team have advised directly uh, the leadership in the, in the United States. And, and one of the, the people that I worked with was uh, Al Gore's uh, science uh, advisor for climate. And another had just rolled off the Obama administration in the Office of Science and Technology and Policy, uh, directly advising the president on climate, uh, climate change science. One of the key findings that, that uh, the, the current stock of research on climate change has, has taught us is that it is a global problem, climate change, but it manifests itself at the regional scale. And there will be all sorts of different challenges that we meet uh, as we encounter the climate change question and challenge uh, at the regional scale. So that's why we're looking at this in terms of the Midwestern and Northeastern United States. We look at food, energy, and water because they're absolutely essential to any society. It's the fundamentals. If you don't get any of those right, you're in uh, deep trouble. Uh, the particular regions of the country that we're looking at um, uh, generate about $7 trillion of GDP. They represent uh, nearly half the U.S. population, not quite half the population. So it's very important from a human standpoint and a development uh, standpoint. Um, now, I'm, I'm not uh, wishing to draw um, any, any um, uh, direct parallels to the history of my country and the history of Europe and, and, um, and um, Hungary, but in our terms, we have had a long interaction with our environment, perhaps two to three hundred, maybe four hundred years, where humans have made a, an important impact on, on the history of the environment in our region. I realize that this goes back millennia in this part of the world. But nonetheless, the idea is that 
the decisions that were made in the past have a legacy effect and we have to understand what those legacy effects are because they last into the present day and any decision that we make today could last well into the coming century and the century after that, etc. Multi-generational is the point I'd like to make. Um, the other reason we look at the region, and you'll see some examples of some research that we've done, is you cannot base the sustainable development agenda on a single case study or two or three case studies. You must look at the regionality of the problem because after all there's a carpet, if you will, of change that we see uh, before us. It's not a single place at a single time. You have to think very integratively and the best way to start, I think, is to look at the regional scale. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about these three basic infrastructures, green, gray, and human infrastructures, okay? And um, they're shown here, I'm going to you know, put a little, little um, uh, uh, diagram here together where we're going to step through this very quickly. So the green infrastructure that we're talking about is iconically shown here. It involves natural watersheds and managed uplands, aquatic ecosystems like the Isla Magna uh, domain. And uh, we have a choice in some sense. We could either manage these systems well, okay, and you get pictures of similar to what you see at the top of the screen here, or you could ma mismanage these systems, and it's very easy to mismanage them, and humans have had a long history of mismanaging the environment. And those bottom images are you know, to remind us that you could go in a very, very different direction if you're not careful, okay? But the green infrastructure we're talking about is ecosystems, nature-based, um, services that are provided to us by nature um, that help us keep the cost down of doing business as humans when, in particular, we design and execute infrastructure. Without well-functioning ecosystems, you have to rehabilitate the environment, you have to rehabilitate, in many cases, the infrastructure that's been destroyed by bad management of the environment. Okay, so you have to make sure that you are designing these systems in a very adaptive and very sustainable way. And again, there's a choice. We can either have very well-managed gray infrastructures, these traditional infrastructures, or we could go in a very different direction and have maladaptive and um, uh, uh, atrophied uh, types of infrastructure. Now, the third type of infrastructure is shown here, and it's the, it's the human infrastructure. And when you think about it, the decisions, whether we're at the top of that diagram or the bottom of the diagram, are really determined by human institutions, uh, human technical capacity, cultural uh, backdrops, and how we care about sustainability in the environment and what a human well-being. And these things are all brought together through these three types of infrastructure. I just want to you know, emphasize the fact that you cannot do it without the humans, you cannot do that without the engineers, and you, can't, you cannot do it without the ecosystem analysts. Um, this is a very complicated diagram. All I wish to, to, to say about it is that there, you need also these frameworks in order to stage the set of questions, make them relevant to stakeholders, and uh, have, them be, have these storylines, as we heard, heard about here, these narratives in the last discussion, uh, have them become quantitative enough so that you can act on them, okay? And so in our particular um, uh, program, we have a set of computer simulation models. Uh, we set these computer simulation models up with assumptions about what the technologies are going to be today and in the future, what the climate is doing, how people are using landscapes, etc. And we set up our models and we are scientists so we uh, appreciate testing hypotheses, okay? And that's one part of what we're trying to do. We run our computer simulations, but then we try to take it to the next step. And, and we have this little box in the, in the middle there, that attempts to create metrics, system performance. How does the whole system, regional system, ecosystems and engineering, how does it deliver services to, to humankind? And we produce these measures, these quantitative metrics. I'll show you a couple of examples in a moment. And we articulate the contributions, uh, what we call ecosystem services portfolios. You create a portfolio of outputs that you can act on. And those, those portfolios are supported by engineering, and they're also supported by, by nature, natural systems. We have an economist on the team who puts it into dollar terms so that we can talk to stakeholders. 
And then we have a very vibrant uh, activity that involves our stakeholders. We call it a charrette process where we sit with the um, these stakeholders, we design narratives or scenarios, we co-design with, with, with our partners, and we talk about policies, we talk about t uh, potential technology points, we tell them what the uh, possible prognosis is for climate change. I put all that together, and through this co-design process, we might have to re-establish the numbers we put in our models. And we do that, and we go around this circle, we keep iterating until we, as scientists, have our natural curiosity beaten to the ground enough to make what we do somewhat uh, uh, applicable to re the real world. Okay, Because if left to our own, as academics, we go in crazy directions. We're trying to, through the circular process of dialogue, make sure that what we produce is, in fact, relevant to those making decisions. Uh, these are our stakeholders. We've targeted about 30 different groups. I am absolutely heartened to see, as I understand, there are 100 mayors of uh, some of the townships in the region here today. This is, to, to my mind, unprecedented, and it's a spectacular testament to the fact that stakeholders are interested in this, this work that's being done, and it's up to us as those providing the knowledge to make it relevant. So uh, you have a wonderful running start on the, on the issue right here. Uh, we've taken a lot of time to try to assemble the, these target groups, but uh, there seems to be a, a great willingness in, in this broader community to come together, and this is, this is really quite fantastic. Uh, let me show you a couple of examples of what you can do when you take that regional perspective. And I'm going to go back to the point that you cannot just have one or two case studies and then develop a, a regional and national policy on sustainable development. You have to really think in a, in a broad context. What I'm showing here is set of, uh, just focus on the reds and the greens, okay? And this is a, 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 the output, or a regional output of a, of a simulation for carbon sequestration or release by the, the landscape, okay? And it involves fossil fuel combustion, but it also involves uh, the impact of, of natural ecosystems abs absorbing, assimilating carbon dioxide, carbon sink. And you know, let's talk about carbon taxes and all of them. So this has an economic dimension as well. So what you can see immediately is there are parts of the region that are extremely red and dark brown, and that means that they're, they're releasing huge amounts of carbon on net. But then you also see that there are opportunities in terms of the green to, to see areas that could actually offset that, that carbon signal and help you to better balance the fossil fuel based pollution that you would see that's flowing into the atmosphere. Okay? And um, if you look at the numbers, you'll see that there's an enormous imbalance. But the point is that providing these visualizations and these metrics, you can begin to have a dialogue, a sensible dialogue, about where you might wish to reduce fossil fuel combustion, where you might take on renewables to a, a larger degree, and where ecosystems can actually help you balance that carbon budget. We've also done a lot of work on the energy sector, and uh, what I'm showing here are some scenarios, so these are the storylines, if you will. And we did an experiment where if you were to uh, increase substantially the efficiency of appliances and light bulbs and such, you probably could reduce the demand for uh, electricity in this region by about 15 to 20 percent. So then the question becomes, if you institute that, that demand-saving measure, um, or demand uh, reduction, uh, what would you do with your savings? And you come up with some really interesting kinds of questions. So what, what, what is your objective? Do you want to um, lower the uh, exposure of populations to pollution, from air pollution, which has an enormous um, you know, human health impact? Well, if you do that, you focus on shutting down the power stations in, um, in the top, uh, top uh, left corner. Okay? Um, uh, in, in general, just to reduce the load. But then someone might say, well, you could reduce the load of pollution going into the atmosphere by closing down these power stations in the left diagram, but in the top right, you should make sure that they're close to population centers, because that's where a reduction of pollution is going to make the most difference, not just closing down the most polluting plants that could be far away from human population. So now all of a sudden you're, you're, you're getting into this notion that 
there are different stakeholders, there are different objectives, and you've got to play out those kinds of scenarios or storylines or narratives in a sensible way. Uh, if, you're, if your uh, sole purpose is to reduce carbon emission by this region, you go to the uh, bottom left and you close down those power stations and use this savings from the high efficiency appliances to just shut down those, those power plants. Okay? So this is a kind of trade-off analysis, but it's, it's at the regional scale. You cannot look at it as one single power station. You've got to look at how electricity is produced at the regional scale. Okay, and uh, again, this is a complicated table, but what I wish to say here is that these portfolios that I'll be speaking with are articulated by line items. It's just like having a budget, um, your own personal budget, or a spreadsheet for, uh, uh, you know, for, for uh, stock company or something. And you have these outputs like food production, biofuels we're interested in, uh, how much water you get from the system that's, that's clean, what thermoelectric production might be, and uh, how many uh, kilometers of pollution from thermal pollution from these power stations do you get. So these are, in some sense, uh, services that you, or, or elements of the environment that are embedded within the regional domain and interact with the engineering. Okay? And, and the environment. We have models, and what we try to do is we try to take physical uh, objects like uh, bushels or me metric tons of corn, uh, or the number of liters of biofuel, and then we convert those into dollar flows using our, our economic models. And now we can begin to talk about some trade-offs. So if someone's interested in uh, producing extra biofuels and irrigating that landscape, that's great for your biofuel production. You get more income from doing that. But you've used up water, so you cannot produce as much electricity by, by cooling those power stations. So those entries go down, and you have a net portfolio value that is looking at these trade-offs between one element and the other, whether you would emphasize one or the other. This, we think, is a really uh, great way to engage the stakeholders because it's in concrete terms, it's in dollar terms, and they can relate to that. Uh, let me uh, go, go across the ocean here and uh, come uh, a little closer to, to where we are today. And uh, this is a, a, a game plan that's been um, proposed as part of the uh, IS craft system uh, to look at the region of Western Pannonia. Okay? And um, there are points here, and there are circles, and there are um, there's the region that we're seeing. And I'm uh, not arguing that we don't look at particular places because uh, you know, uh, Best Brain has a very different uh, backdrop and scenery, if you will, uh, than Kose, okay? And we have to honor the fact that there are regional differences, but if, by the same token, we can begin to think about how you unite these different uh, parts of a, a particular region into a holistic vision, okay? And um, I was um, uh, honored to, to be working with some very talented Hungarian and U.S. Um, students who came to uh, Kusei in the summer of 2018, 2018, three years ago. And um, uh, we brought them together and we uh, began to look at uh, developing a circular economy concept, starting more locally in the Kusei, in the Kusei environment, uh, environment uh, environments, I should say. And uh, we produced a report. I suppose you have to contact the IS people and send you a copy of that report. Uh, but we talked about circular economy, okay? And here are some infrastructures like we just talked about in, in the project that I mentioned uh, for the, for the uh, US Midwest and, and Northeast. So we have uh, what we anticipated to be a, a transformational object. It was called a Center for Eco Innovation, okay? And that is the let's say the meeting grounds, if you will, for trying to produce a circular economy in which you reduce the uh, necessity of bringing in imported products of a variety of stuff, including fuels to, to uh, power the society. Uh, so the idea is you take this Center for Eco Innovation and you work, for example, in the city or the urban or urban uh, natural complex and you produce goods, and the goods are uh, consumed by the, the humans who live in that area, and the humans produce waste. And if you, uh, if you configure this in the right way, you can 
create waste streams that become nutrients that are then fed back to the ecosystems, those environments that I earlier said are so important to, to maintain. And then they produce raw materials, resources, renewable resources, that are fed back into the eco-innovation center idea, and that produce goods and services to the, uh, to the city and eco-regional complex. Okay, so this is in very, very broad terms what a circular economy is about. Now, uh, in closing that whole schema uh, are these, uh, these blue-colored arrows, and these are where that human infrastructure comes in. We're talking about education. We're talking about workforce development, we're talking about outreach to make sure that people understand the value of what, what's going on here. Uh, all in the, in the spirit of community and uh, innovative policy, uh, I mean the government understand that these are partnerships that involve both the private and public and academic sectors. And how will investments in the future be made to, to, to create something along these lines? And I think that it, certainly it, it is achievable and imminently possible with the right resources. This is just a couple of the images that you will find in the report. Um, and uh, here's the map, the inset map on the top, top left. And here we're talking about uh, a, little, um, uh, a little island uh, enterprise that has biodigestion for waste processing and rooftop solar systems and micro hydro to uh, minimize the impact of, uh, of large reservoirs in any, any uh, part of the Space the Virginia uh, stream. And uh, we talk about some of these innovative uh, green infrastructures like infiltration uh, uh, basins and permeable uh, pavements, rainwater harvesting, these kinds of things. Okay. And this is very much at the, at the case study level, but this is the kind of circularization mentality that you would see, hopefully, distributed over a whole region. Um, you also can set up a crucible or a test tube, if you will for some really interesting next generation uh, science and technology in the world of sustainability. And this is an, an example that I'm uh, proposing here, where on the right side we have these ecosystems, okay? And we have actually the computer simulations that show you some results from. So we have these stocks and flows of all of these, uh, these different uh, boxes that you see on, on the right here. And that's all well and good for an ecologist, but if you want to bring some value to society, you may need to begin to demonstrate what that ecosystem brings to you right, in terms of human well-being. And so there's this concept we're, we're floating around now of, of creating these blockchains, these uh, blockchains that are used, I guess, in cryptocurrency uh, to perhaps ill, Ill, uh, Ill end. Uh, but we like to put it to good use, and, and the idea would be uh, to create innovative next generation sensor systems of the environment. Understand what's going on with the environment, uh, verify those, uh, those numbers, and then begin to look at how it, these uh, numbers can be incentivized in terms of investments, for example, by the private sector or the public sector. And having a schema like this where you're bringing business thinking directly into ecosystems could be uh, the way that we establish and verify the sustainability uh, we, we think. So this is my uh, uh, we're seeking. Now this is the last slide here and uh, uh, this really does emphasize again the absolute necessity of partnerships. Okay, And this is just an example set of partnerships that were assembled early on in our, in our thinking. Uh, but we're this is a big boat that has to float, okay? And we can't do it just as academics. We're going to need the government behind this. We're going to need um, uh, training of a variety of sorts, not just, a, not just um, our training at the university level, but also in terms of uh, technical, vocational technical training. Towns and cities need to be engaged as general public. And uh, I think none of this is going to really happen unless we engage the private sector. It's absolutely essential to bring private business interest into this domain, or else it's going to be a constant struggle to incentivize any of what we're talking about here. So that's my last slide, and um, thanks for your time and attention. Thank you.